Renee, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm doing great, Brad. How about you? I I am awesome. I I have goosebumps. I always tell this to my listeners. I'm just so blessed and lucky to have these absolutely incredible guests who have been on these journeys and just, just all kinds of good stuff. You have been on a journey. Oh my goodness. 40 years. Mm. I was reading a little bit about your story. 40 years uh, until 2012 when something happened, Uh, Mm. something, a light bulb clicked or something like that. So uh, let's just dive right into this. What, What was going on and what happened back in 2012 that allowed you to, I guess, figure out this permanent weight loss button and this emotional eating button? Well, I will say I started my first diet when I was 10. Wow. Don't rag on my mother. She was trying to help me. Okay, no worries. <laughs> I was 10 years old and I was the only redhead in my class. And all my little friends, blondes and brunettes, were little sticks. And I was a chunky redhead. And I thought, I can't do anything about the hair color, but I could do something about that. So that's where the whole 40 years started. So in 2012, I was staring down my 50th birthday. Okay. And I, I believed at the time <clears throat> that if a woman doesn't lose the weight before 50, she's got no chance of doing it afterwards. Oh, okay. So I thought, this is my last chance. If I don't figure this out, I'm going to be fat for the rest of my life. And I started a new diet. It was my New Year's resolution yet again. <laughs> <laughs> for the 40th time then or 41st? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, so... So um, I started my diet and I did real well for a couple of weeks and then I fell off and then I started again and fell off. And this went on until April. And in April, I went to my closet to get dressed to go to work Mm -hmm. and nothing fit. Even my fat clothes, Brad, didn't fit. And I thought- Like too small? (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Wow. Okay. Okay. Everything was too small. I actually had to use a safety pin that day so I could go to work. And I was absolutely mortified. I thought, this is going the wrong direction. And I, I, I was a mess. I had to redo my mascara for work. So <laughs> when I came home, I thought, okay, we've got to figure this out. And I got on the internet to do some research. And I ran across this this um, URL. And I thought, hmm, I might need to look at this. And it was about weight loss, but there was something different in it. Mm -hmm. And I uh, bought the course because I thought maybe this will help. And then eventually I hired the creator of the course to be my coach. Okay. Because I, what I've learned about myself is that I do really well with external accountability. I do anything in the world for you, man. (laughs) <laughs> hey, okay. Hey, I'll hope to do that someday. <laughs> but to do it for myself, eh, maybe, maybe not. So having someone to hold me accountable week after week made a difference for me. And what what interested me was we didn't talk so much about food or diet. We talked a lot about the emotional stuff that made me want the food. So that's when I recognized, okay, this is emotional eating. This is how I can fix it. And I did with her help. And we did spend a little more time together, but I did reach my goal weight by my 50th birthday, the week before, in fact, and I've been there ever since. Well, congratulations. So what you you learned was it was the emotional triggers behind the, the eating and everything. So with the uh, help of your coach, you learn to overcome whatever, whatever those emotional uh, challenges. Yes. Because Brad, if you're not eating for emotional reasons, it saves a whole bunch of calories. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, let me, let me, I wanted to get to some specific questions with you today, Ray, uh, Renee, to, to help our listeners. So first one I thought was really good that you had on your, your profile is why mm. do diets fail? We stop doing them. I mean, it, it is that that's a little bit facetious, but that's that's it. We we get tired of it or we get upset. We want to go to, you know, get some pizza or whatever. And we just completely abandon the way of eating that is better for our bodies. 
But if you can find what works for your body, then you'll be more satisfied. But we still have to pay attention to that emotional eating situation because you can rack up a bunch of calories in that. Very quickly, very quickly. I remember just a, a quick side story working as a trainer years ago, and I would walk out of the gym and on my right, I had fast food restaurants, A, B, and C. On my left, I had fast food restaurants, X, Y, and Z. And straight ahead, I had, you know, about six or seven other fast food restaurants. So it's, we're constantly surrounded by food everywhere we it's go. It's everywhere. Yeah. The smells, yeah. even for me as a trainer and health coach, I like the smell of pizza and ice cream and well, all of that good stuff. Um, so you just mentioned something, you have to find what works for you. So is that how you make a diet work then is, is to kind of just figure out what works for you then, I guess, or. Yeah. What I do with my clients now is what I did. Um, and, you know, two years into my journey, I was still maintaining, but I was tired, hungry, and cranky all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I thought there's got to be something better than this. Mm-hmm. So I did some more research because that's what I do. And I ran across a metabolic test. And so all of my clients, first thing, we do this metabolic test. And what it told me was that I needed different foods in my life. And I thought, oh, this is makes absolutely no sense to me, but I'll give it a shot for a week and see what happens. Now, by this time, I was 52. Okay. I was at my goal weight. I'm only five foot three. So I'm a little woman. Okay. So I was at 119 pounds. Okay. I ate the cheese sauce and bacon and the foods that I really love for a week in the proportions that they gave me, which were, I was not hungry. I'll tell you that. I was not hungry and I was not cranky. And I lost two pounds and I thought, whoa, dude, that's, I don't understand that, but I like it. And my husband likes it because I'm a happier person. Right. And I wasn't tired at all. So if we find what works for you and people can do it for themselves, they just have to do a lot of trial and error and keeping track of what's going on. And if it helps you feel better then okay, that's a good idea. Um, But it's just a kind of a shortcut to do this metabolic test. And it, I have lived with it at my goal weight for another eight years. Well, where can someone find out about this metabolic test if they're interested? Well, I mean, you can do all kinds of research. There's some that are better than others. I have one that I use that, that works really well. And again, I give it to all my clients. Um, but yeah, just metabolic tests. If it, But I'll tell you, if they don't charge you anything, you get what you pay for. Oh, good point. Yeah, good point. I mean, this this gives you tells you what kind of of body you have, what what your metabolic type is. It gives you foods to avoid and foods to to use at more often, and then it gives you a, a sample diet for a week, so you'll know what you need. And also for anyone listening, uh, trial and error that was a big part of my journey. Also, mm-hmm. it took me. I'd probably say about two years of tweaking to figure out uh, what worked, not just what worked, but what I enjoyed. Mm. That's a big component of it too. It may work, yeah. but not enjoying it. Um, the chances of sticking with it long term are, are not good. So yeah, so mm. I, I wish there was just a, a secret, you know, wand that I could wave or Renee, you could wave that says, here's a one size fits all. This is what you do exactly. Bing, bing, bing. But unfortunately it's not like that. You do have to go through that journey of, of, of trial and error. So, well, and one of the things that I find <clears throat> interesting is we have all these cookie cutter diets. Mm-hmm. They'll work for anyone. The difference is in how you feel about it, whether it meets your needs, how you feel, if it makes you tired, hungry, and cranky. <laughs> It was so I lost my weight on a whole different thing, right? But we are all so different. I mean, if they can use our fingerprints, our irises for identification, apparently they can use our tongues and our ears as well. But if we are all that different that we can be identifiable by certain parts of our body, why would one diet work for everyone? And you're right, you've got to find what works, what keeps you satisfied, what doesn't send you off into a tiz. It 
takes time. As you were working on your tweaking process, the trial and error, what, what kept you going? What kept you motivated? I just wanted to lose the weight. I really, I mean, I was starving. I was on 1200 calories. Again, I'm a little woman, so that's an appropriate amount for weight loss. Um, <clears throat> but I just wanted to hit my goal before I turned 50, that I was determined. So that that helped. But the two years after that were difficult, just trying to maintain. And so one of the other questions that you ask, you know, how do we manage emotional eating? That was a big part of your journey. So mm -hmm. after you worked with your coach, how did you continue to to? I guess, overcome the emotional eating challenges or did they just like you were cured and boom, that was it. Or <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think it, it's sort of like, um, algebra, do they still do algebra? Algebra they versus they do it a different way. I couldn't do it how they do it in today's school. Yeah. So it's like algebra versus first or second grade math. You learn what's going on. You're like, okay, I'm feeling this. Normally, I would go get peanut butter, but I don't want to do that because that's not going to help me <clears throat> in the quantities that I would have it in those days. Use the higher level understanding, emotional intelligence to make a different choice. But you've got to get a certain measure of healing for your heart before you can do that. That's a huge part of it. I think a lot of people don't understand that part right there. Their focus really on just the, the dieting and, and the losing weight and the number on a scale, mm. but that healing of the heart, that's the emotional key right there. That's exactly the key. Because if you're, if you're constantly working with that burden, that baggage that you've been dragging with you for decades, how are you going to unpack it? I mean, what are you going to, uh, it, it, it makes it so difficult to not react to that when it's still there. But if we can unpack it and pack for the journey you actually want to be on rather than the one you kind of fell into, you'll be so much happier. But you've got to unpack it first. Yeah, I had another uh, guest on here a while back, maybe two, three months ago. Um, she discovered something, I mean, basically the same thing in, in her journey. Uh, it's about uncovering what's going on inside of you and healing that. And then the food is no longer the, uh, the outlet, I guess. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, think about this, Brad. Um, we all have a trigger food. If you're an emotional eater, you have a trigger food. Do you know what yours is? Ice cream. <laughs> Ice cream. <laughs> okay. So, do you remember when you and that is? It, I, I almost have I to laugh because too, yeah, but. <laughs> men men go to ice cream nine times out of ten. It's it's incredible. Okay. So, do you remember when you first had ice cream? Oh boy. Um, I have to say I don't actually. What's the first you do kind of remember? As a little boy, oh gosh, maybe four or five, probably four years old, I started to play soccer. And every time I scored a goal, my mom would buy me ice cream. So that's yes. yeah. 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 Because it gives you that feeling of affirmation. Yeah. Oh, you're right. It just, wow, it just triggered something in me. I didn't even thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if it, how else can you get that affirmation without the ice cream? Yeah. That way you get control of it. You can still have the ice cream, but you have control of it. And for me, it was peanut butter okay. and it was directly connected. I, I could tell when I was circling the refrigerator, ready to going back for another scoop of ice, of ice cream, of peanut butter. <laughs> there you go. I got you saying ice cream. <laughs> um, then I knew that there was something I needed and it was directly connected to my grandmother. She and I were tight and she is the only person I have known my entire life. And I never questioned whether or not she loved me. The love and encouragement she gave me was a rock. So once she passed away, I was using the peanut butter to fill the space. And I had to recognize she is not in that jar. <laughs> there are other ways to get that kind of love and encouragement. And once I figured out that, then I was free of the peanut butter. Mind, I didn't buy it for two years, which really upset my dog because oh. he loved it. Right. But it was like I couldn't have it in the house for a period of time. 
till I could get it completely broken. And even now it lives in a, a refrigerator that's in the garage. So I have to actually have an extra step between me and the peanut butter. Okay. You bring up a very interesting point because once you remove something, in this case, the peanut butter, kind of how, how the laws of nature at work, something else will take its place. Anytime there's a void in nature created, something has to fill that void. Uh, so you were able to replace the peanut butter. Do you mind if I ask what, what were you able to replace it with? Something non-food, I assume, or was it? Yes. Food? Yeah. And it was just a, a taking the time to sit down for a moment, recognize, okay, here's what you want. How can you go get that right now? How can you arrange for that? Because the need is still there. You're absolutely right. And it could be a phone call. Sometimes it was going out and playing with the dog. Sometimes it was going to my husband and saying, I really need a hug. And I need to know that you love me and will affirm me right now. He's like, oh, yes, whatever. (laughs) Because he benefits from me being better, doesn't he? Well, yeah. Happy spouse, happy house, something like that, I think they said. Um, happy wife, happy life. Yes, that's the other one they say. <laughs> what, what would you say, Renee, to anyone listening right now who's dealing with emotional eating? Find what's driving you to food and face that, and then you can be free. Because <clears throat> we have to find that driver. Because otherwise, it's unsupervised and driving us all over the place to things that we don't necessarily want to be into. And just to be specific, what do you mean by driver? There's that feeling when you're upset or frustrated or sad, mad, whatever. I mean, we even do it with happy things like feast days, holidays. Oh, we're going to have this and this and this because it makes us feel a way we always have. And we're looking for that feeling. So if, if you recognize, okay, I am really upset and I want a cookie. What is it you're upset about? What can we do about that? How can you get that need met in a different way? So, for example, my husband and I had a holiday planned. And uh, four days before we were to leave on that holiday, my grandmother died. Mm, Sorry. Yeah, I was sad. And I was sad. And we had the funeral. And the day after, we went on this holiday. And literally, I was like a sick puppy following him around. I said, just go where you want to go. I'll go with you, but help me. Because I, I just, I, I was devastated. I mean, she was 93. It should have been fine, but she was such an important part of my life. So for the first three days, all I did was follow him. On the third day, um, we went to an area where they have like books and games and puzzles and things that you can check out and take to your room and bring it back when you finish the holiday. <clears throat> and I picked up a puzzle because I thought, well, I can do that. There's so much soothing in doing that puzzle for me. You know, puzzles have rules. They make sense. If all the pieces are there, you will have a picture when you finish. It's the same reason men like sports. You play by the rules, you do well. Yeah. And it was so soothing to me that I came out of the funk. I still miss my, my nan. Yeah. But I came out of the funk with it because I found something to soothe my heart. And it seems so silly that a puzzle would do that, but it did. So a key piece really, and it can be difficult. You, you mentioned you're looking for that feeling Mm -hmm. and food provides that feeling, but we know food doesn't work. Right. So we need to find something that does work. In your case, it was a puzzle. So again, for anyone listening, it's kind of that journey uh, of trial and error. Um, Mm -hmm. The food is not working. We have to find something that does work. Uh, In my case, it's running. The, the food does work. Okay. It's just the long-term consequences are, oh, okay. are not good. Okay. Right? That's, that's a better way to say that. <laughs> food does provide the feeling you're looking for, just the mm-hmm. consequences. So we need to find something that not only works for you, but has a healthy consequence, I guess. Right. 
Right. And for you, it's running, which it does have yeah. a healthy consequence, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot about myself and my life uh, over the years uh, since I started uh, running and, and doing some of that stuff. So yeah, fascinating stuff. Another question that I'm, I'm blown away by that was on your profile is how do you make a resolution work for you? Uh, we all, we all set resolutions. I, I actually don't set resolutions anymore. That's a whole nother story, but I know a lot of people do. And of course, you know, two to three weeks later, they've stopped or quit already. So how do you make a resolution work for you? You have to resolve the issue that's driving the behavior. Because if you don't resolve the issue driving the behavior, you can't change the behavior for an extended period of time. Yeah. You can change it shortly, but you can't do it long-term because the issue will come back and either find that behavior or another one that could be just as destructive. Because think about it. People who give up smoking often take up food because they're still looking for that oral stimulation. A baby in the womb will suck its thumb. When the baby comes out and cries, we put something in its mouth, whether it's the bottle or the breast or a pacifier. And then a child gets to the point where the, the pacifier is taken away from them. So they may go to their thumb or biting their nails. And as you get older and those things aren't acceptable anymore, we go to pizza or donuts or anything else we can put in our mouth for soothing. If you find a way to soothe your issue, because that's what we're looking for is we're looking for soothing and that's okay, but there are just better ways to do it. Healthier ways that, that can empower this. Uh, let me ask you this. So now that you're, you know, 10 years post, 2012, when you started to really understand this, what would the U of today tell the U of you 20 years ago that was in the thick of that yo-yo dieting that you, that you call it? It's not about the diet. It's not about the diet. It's about what drives you to food for comfort or stress relief. Find that, resolve that issue, work on your self-esteem for heaven's sake, please, because that's really important because that drives so much of our behavior that is not helpful. Working on yourself, uh, I think is the key or the main, I don't want to say main goal, but that is the key behind this. And when you work on yourself, everything else, kind of the diet, the weight loss becomes a byproduct and uh, becomes, uh, in my case, I say, you know, it became the weight loss became a byproduct and just naturally came off when I wasn't even paying attention to the yes. Life but it just came off when I was focusing on everything else going on. Yes. Yeah. Because people say, how much weight can I lose? I, said, I don't know. How much can you lose? The issue is let's work on this stuff, these pieces, and then you won't have to think about how much weight you lose because it'll just melt away. Were you ever like scared or afraid at any time, like post 2012? Because what you're describing is, is someone who really has to take responsibility for their behavior and what's going on in their life. They have to, well, one of the things I say in, in my manual uh, on my website is you have to own your journey. Mm -hmm. um, were, were you ever afraid or like, I mean, that that's huge taking that responsibility. How, how are you able to do that part of it? Well, I think it's an ongoing process, Brad. I mean, yes, I did it for the weight, but I continue to do it for other things because we're, you know, the, um, the illustration of the layers of the onion, you just peel one layer at a time and then you work on the next one because I don't think we can ever stop growing. There's always another level that we can get to if we want to. So was I afraid at times? Absolutely, because all of my comfort zones were being taken away from me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I'm still that way today on some things because I'm out of my comfort zone in so many ways, running a business, coaching people, counseling people, helping them figure out. And then somebody comes in with something I've never heard before and I think, it's okay. It still comes down to something along these lines. We'll get there. So, yeah, but, you know, that's where the adventure is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for, for you and me, yeah, I, it it's, can be scary, though, yeah. Yeah, of course it is, but if you're not scared, you're not doing much, are you? 
Yeah. Uh, both you and I have one thing in common. You mentioned the word earlier, the word determined. And mm-hmm. that is one of those intangible things that you, yeah, again, you just, you have to, I don't want to say look yourself in the mirror, but you, you just really have to own your journey and yeah, take responsibility and say, okay, I got to do the work on me. Mm-hmm. Have that determination and that commitment to mm-hmm. just through and, and you did. So uh, one, another question you had, um, you, you asked after 40 years on a diet, what made the difference in 2012 uh, to now? I think in 2012, I finally recognized what I was dealing with. It's like, it is emotional eating. You've got to fix that. You've got to find your way through that. You've got to find another way to soothe yourself. So that, that was what was the, the impetus. You know, again, I was staring down my 50th birthday <laughs> and I didn't want to be, didn't want to hit 60 at that kind of weight. And I knew if I didn't arrest it, then it was never going to change. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And last one you have here, what's the real secret for losing weight and maintaining the loss? I think I know what you're going to say, but I want, I'll ask you anyway. (laughs) The real secret is do what works for you. I I have a a three-part program and it is your body. So find what works for your body your baggage, let's deal with that emotional stuff that's driving you to food. Let's unpack that so you can be free. And the third thing is your best. Because if we get back in touch with our best selves, we always make better choices. So often it does come down to the wounds we have and how we deal with them and how we heal. Again, healing your heart is so important and it's so freeing. And I think also, again, I'm not a a licensed counselor or anything, but part of healing your heart and emotional eating, you have to first recognize that there is an issue going on. It's that and admit it to yourself and say, okay, I need help. And (laughs) speaking of help, Renee, if someone wants to to work with you or reach out to you, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, My website is packyourownbag.com. And I'm on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all the rest of it. Okay. I think I have links to those from your profile page. Uh, if not, I'll ask you, but yeah, I'll, I'll put a, I'll, for anyone listening, I, I will put a link to her website on my podcast show notes and, and the podcast description. Wow. We've covered a lot in about 30 minutes. This is been- <laughs> uh, Renee, you've said a lot. Is there anything else that you would like to say? Any, any final tips or comments or, or anything? Oh, I often say it's not hard to overcome emotional eating. But you do have to get the hang of it. And hang is an acronym. So the H is, am I hungry? And if you're hungry, you may need something to eat. If you're not hungry, then A, what is the attraction to food in this moment? What is drawing you? The N is, what is it that I actually need? I know I need soothing. What will do that for me? And the G is go, go get that because that will soothe you more than food ever possibly could. Renee, thank you very much for being here today. I sure appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Okay, everyone. Thank you again for listening. This has been the Be Well, Be Safe, Be Happy, Eat Ice Cream podcast. As I always say, uh, until we meet again, everyone, take care and we'll see you next time.